Welcome everyone. I'm just going to wait a few more, uh, one, one or two more minutes till everybody seems to be here before we get started. Well, I think we're, I'm going to get started now to, uh, we have a, a, a lot of panelists and I want to make sure that they all have the time they need um, to make their presentations. Welcome to all of you to, I think, with what will be our penultimate COVID-19 uh, demography PAA uh, webinar. Um, I, we're really delighted to have this particular series, this particular webinar, um, COVID-19 in Sub-Saharan Africa. We are planning a, uh, in another webinar uh, in November, right before Thanksgiving and uh, the thank you, American Thanksgiving holiday. And, um, and I'll make a, show us, share with you the, the plan for that at the end of today's webinar. So without further ado, I wanna thank in particular, uh, Dr. Philip, Anglovich, who is a associate professor at Johns Hopkins University and uh, organized this particular session and has been a leader in the field in longitudinal uh, research mm -hmm. in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so thank you, Phil, for doing this and take it away. Thanks very much, Sarah. And hi, and welcome to everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure of mine to chair this session, uh, this webinar on COVID in sub-Saharan Africa. And just want to start with a few brief notes before we begin. Um, as you all probably know, there are five total presentations. Each one will be about 15 minutes long. If you have questions, you'll note that there is a Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So any questions, please type them in there. And I think the uh, presenters will make attempts to answer those questions as they come in. Uh, but we also hope to have time for some questions at the end. Uh, so we'll... Um, We'll see how much time we have left for that, but, uh, but I think we should have 10 or 15 minutes for a few select questions at the end. Also, just one note, uh, please keep yourself muted during the presentations. Um, and I think that said, uh, we can get started with the first presentation. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Elizabeth Gummerson, who will be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on economic status in Kenya, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, and Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay. All right, uh, you all are seeing my desktop, hopefully not the question slide, <laughs> the Q&A. Um, so thank you all for, for having me. Um, my name, as I said, is Dr. Elizabeth Gummerson and um, I work for the PMA project and I'm gonna be presenting some research on some of the economic indicators that we've seen in our COVID-19 surveys in Africa. I have way more to say than I can fit in in 15 minutes, so I'm going to dive right in, but just very briefly to acknowledge uh, my co-authors on this work written there, as well as all of the PIs uh, in the PA, PMA countries and their teams, which have been done an extraordinary job collecting this data um, in a fairly short turnaround. So uh, this COVID research came about in the context of a larger project. Um, it uh, was funded by, it's a PMA project, it's called Performance Monitoring for Action, and it's funded by the Gates Foundation, and it's been ongoing since 2013. So we're currently in eight countries, and we collect a couple different types of data, but the main sort of core is that we have a representative household survey of women who are just focused on family planning and reproductive health. And then we also take a sample of facilities in the regions where we interview the women, and we conduct interviews with facility managers and clients to sort of simultaneously understand what's going on in the service environment at the same time. So from 2013 to 2018, we did this with a new cross-sectional sample every year. Um, and starting in 2019, we changed the design um, so for now, we go back to the same women every year. So now it's actually a non longitudinal panel. And we did the same thing with the facility. So basically, we have two panels, a female household panel and a simultaneous facility panel. So 
uh, lots of exciting data being collected. And I think even prior to COVID, uh, we were really looking forward to doing some rich longitudinal analysis. And then halfway through the data collection for our baseline in March, uh, COVID hit. So we had completed baseline data collection in four geographies in Kenya, DRC, Burkina Faso, and Kenya when we had to pull all of our teams out of the field for, uh, for obvious reasons for an indefinite amount of time. So we hadn't actually started data collection in Uganda, Niger, uh, India, and Cote d'Ivoire. And so that was disappointing, but it was also a real opportunity because we realized that we had a representative sample for whom we already had baseline data um, and permission to recontact. And if you recall at the time, there was very little information on COVID um, in low and medium income countries. And the information that was coming out was generally from rapid fire phone or text surveys, which was really useful, um, but not necessarily representative. So we felt like we could get representative data. Um, and we'd still have to conduct our interviews by phone, but because we had already visited everyone in our sample in person, and so unlike other surveys, we already knew a fair amount about our sample respondents and sort of who had a phone and who didn't and how they differ. So we're able to weight our data for phone and their ownership and uh, hopefully get a better, better overall representative picture. So we repurposed our six month follow-up sample um, to, recontact the entire sample with a phone survey that was focused on COVID. Um, it was about a 30 minute survey. Um, the topics covered are there. Uh, we wanted to ask a lot, but we had to sort of get as much into 30 minutes as we could. We had really good response rates. Um, it was above 95% in all geographies for the women that we were able to get onto the phone. Now that's not all women. So if someone didn't have phones and someone didn't answer their phones. So our overall response rate was, I think, uh, was between 72% and 75% in the geographies that I'm presenting. Um, I'm gonna focus on a couple of results from the socioeconomic questions. Um, and I'm presenting results from four geographies. And I keep saying geographies um, because it, it, it covers both countries and, and urban areas. So we fielded the COVID surveys in two nationally representative panels. So for Burkina Faso and Kenya, the results are nationally representative. And then two are uh, representative urban panels. So it's uh, Kinshasa in the DRC and Lagos in Nigeria. So if you all can set your mind back to the spring of this year, there was not a lot of hard data available on any of the impacts, economic or otherwise. Um, everyone felt that the impacts would be huge, but what little data was available, uh, I think was suggesting that there were already starting to be winners and losers in terms of both the economic and the health consequences. So we were starting to see women, minorities, people in the informal sectors and service jobs were bearing disproportionately both the economic and health impacts. And I kind of assuming if you're on this webinar, you're probably already aware of all the ways that the economic and health impacts are sort of inextricably linked. So that has potential to have knock on consequences on inequality uh, that outlast this pandemic. So that's really kind of our overarching research question goal at the top, which is what is this going to mean in terms of exacerbating inequality um, in, in the PMA countries? And so we're interested in looking at this both in the short term and the long term. And because the PME panel is going for at least three years, we should actually be able to follow these women in their households to see them kind of before, during, and hopefully after the pandemic to kind of see how it plays out over time and answer some interesting questions about um, resiliency as well. But the results I have to show you today are just focused on the short term. Um, and today, I think I'm really only going to be able to talk about these first three questions um, on the research agenda. If there's time later in the Q&A, we can go more into some of the other questions. But for now, I'm focusing on those first three. So <clears throat> I'm going to show you results on two economic indicators that we collected in our uh, phone survey. And the first is household income loss. And that's whether a household had experienced, we asked the women if her household experienced no income loss, partial income loss, or complete income loss since the beginning of the COVID restrictions. And then we also asked about food and food security. So that question was whether any adult in the household, not just the woman herself, had gone 24 hours without eating anything because there was not enough food since the beginning of the COVID restrictions. 
And for people who work on food insecurity, I'll just acknowledge there's a whole scale of questions about sort of mild, moderate, and severe food insecurity. And this particular question is kind of at the end measuring severe food insecurity. And then um, we also looked at what I, I kind of think of as the usual suspects of socioeconomic and demographic covariates and a regression model, which I'm gonna show you at the end. Um, and uh, let me just make two quick comments about the measurements and the timing. So unless I've marked it here as a baseline measure, everything here was measured at the time of the COVID survey. And I guess the main thing to just point out is that the household wealth si um, measurement was actually a baseline measure, not measured at the same time that we were um, measuring income loss. And then the other thing I wanted to comment on is the time frame since the beginning of the COVID restriction, because that actually is a little bit different by country, depending on when um, restrictions on movement were put in place and when we conducted our phone interviews. And so in our geographies, that ranges from about uh, four weeks in Kenya to about closer to eight weeks in Burkina Faso. So the timeframes are slightly different when you're looking at the countries uh, next to each other. So I'm trying to get a ton into a single slide here, so bear with me. But what we're looking at here is the percentage of women in each wealth tertile, and that was again measured prior to COVID at baseline, who reported no income loss, partial income loss, or complete income loss. So on the left hand side here um, is the lowest wealth tertile. This is for each geography um, up to the highest in the right. And so this dark blue are the percentage of women that um, reported that they had no income loss whatsoever in their household. And this lightest blue is the percentage of women who reported that their household had lost all of its income. Um, just the coding of this sidebar, the things that are coming directly from this graph are in purple, the things that are in black, I'm just telling you. So in case people are trying to sort of match those findings to the graph and getting confused, that's why. Um, so the biggest surprise to me from this actually was the extent. Um, so Burkina Faso, I think is doing sort of the best in terms of household income loss, but uh, in total in Burkina Faso, almost 75% of women reported partial or complete household income loss since the beginning of the COVID restrictions. And then in the other th three geographies, it was above 90%. So I think just the sheer scale of income loss uh, was a surprising finding. I think the second thing that was surprising to me um, was that contrary to some patterns that you know we were seeing in the global north, there wasn't much of an economic gradient. Now, Lagos here in completing is the exception that proves the rule, um, but where we sort of have the most household complete income loss and the lowest worth tertile and getting better as you go higher. Um, but I expected to see that pattern everywhere and across partial and complete. Um, and for the most part, we don't really see that. Um, you know, across the wealth tertiles, people are reporting similar levels of partial income loss and complete household income loss. So, you know, four to eight weeks in, this is really a shock that is impacting people across the board. Moving from income loss to uh, the consequences of income loss, which is hunger. And I just want to note again, um, that we're talking about the sort of more severe form of food insecurity here in the food insecurity scale. Um, and I think this was a little bit of a shock to us and also I think to most of the ministries that we presented this data to, which is just the sheer levels of food insecurity. So just to describe this again, this light green in the bar is the percentage of women who are reporting that someone in their household has gone 24 hours without eating anything because there just wasn't enough food in the house. Um, and you know, this is the total numbers overall in Kinshasa, that was 40% of women reported that. Um, in Kenya, it was almost 30% of women reported that. Um, and contrary to the income loss graphs, you do see a pretty clear gradient. I mean, this is a very clear socioeconomic gradient here in terms of who's experiencing food insecurity. So um, the story that I see in these graphs is that, you know, at least in this first phase of the restrictions in the pandemic, everyone across the board is taking an economic hit, but poorer households are being pushed into severe food insecurity at much higher levels. Although I think 
you know, there is something to say it's not negligible even among the wealthiest households. So if you think, you know, 23, almost 24% of women in Kenya in the highest wealth fertile are reporting that somebody in their house didn't eat for 24 hours. So I think the message here is, is for me anyways, that there is a very real and a little bit of a scary impact, um, even in places where the actual infection rates are not necessarily that high. And you know all the caveats here about our imperfect knowledge of infection rates. But um, prior to the beginning of this webinar, we were actually talking about, the presenters were actually talking about how you know, most, most of these geographies, these PMA geographies in, in Africa, you know, governments moved really quickly and decisively to contain the virus. And you know, certainly from our data, we're showing that people themselves had very high adherence to social distancing and protective behaviors. Um, and I think there is a real epidemiological success story here about COVID that's maybe not getting enough press. Um, but even in, in the midst of that, there are you know, very real health impacts, and uh, particularly in terms of food insecurity. And so I'm about to show you, um, you know, concentrated among households and, and people with children. So uh, diving into that third question about where these impacts are concentrated and what's protective and what is not. And so these are the coefficients on the multivariate logit, looking at sort of the individual and household level predictors of complete household income loss, losing everything compared to not losing anything. Um, and I'll say a note aside that we looked at this in multiple ways and changed the reference categories and the patterns are pretty similar. So I'm, I'm just showing this one. So um, these are relative risk ratios. And um, what this is a pooled sample, I should say. Um, so we pulled all the samples together and included geography fixed effects. Um, and we also stratified by urban and rural because we thought the differences might, the impacts might be different in urban and rural areas. So the estimate for the total sample is in blue, the estimate for the urban sample is in orange, and the estimate for the purple uh, rural sample is in purple. So when we're looking at household income loss, um, you know, some of the things that I might have expected to be have an effect such as wealth turtile, don't really, I'm sorry, this is the relative risk of one is this dotted line right here. So this is kind of, you wanna um, have your confidence intervals to not cross it. Otherwise it's no difference in relative risk. So things like uh, wealth turtile don't make much of a difference. Education doesn't make much. This is the woman's education herself, but if there's educational sorting, you might think that that would uh, show a difference. Um, but, what does make a big difference is if the woman has children. So, so the missing category here is no children. And so if a woman has children, the risk of her living in a household that has lost all of its income is the relative risk is much higher and that increases with the more children that she has. Um, older women have a slightly higher risk uh, than women the 15 to 24 is the missing category here. Um, and uh, the woman's own employment status and own education at baseline doesn't make any difference. And then finally, we find that um, in most cases, not so much in rural because it has larger, but the having a larger household size is protective and which kind of makes sense mathematically. Can, the more people that you have in the household, the better chance that at least one of them has managed to hold on to some kind of income stream. Oh, I've already used up all my time, but this is my last slide. So uh, this is the food insecurity. This is the same type of regression with the same covariates on uh, a binary logistic on food insecurity. And here you see a stronger association. And again, the expected pattern. So uh, women who have children are at a much higher risk of living in food insecure households. Um, incidentally, I was just looking at some Urban Institute findings, the same thing here in the US from around the same time, households with children are uh, reporting food insecurity at about three, per, consistently at about three percentage points higher rates than households without children. Um, in this case, education is highly protective for food insecurity. Um, although in urban areas, you, having a post-primary education is not that protective. Um, although having tertiary is, is protective everywhere. And then we also see the, the wealth gradient that I would have expected to see. So being in the highest wealth, uh, highest wealth um, tertile, even controlling for all of these other things protects your house from being food insecure, which makes sense. The woman's work herself is not quite, um, is not uh, statistically significant. 
Um, and then the last finding that was sort of statistically significant on food insecurity is that being married in urban areas only uh, is protective against food insecurity. So I'm going to stop there because I've already used up more than my time, but just to say um, much more to come, much more to say about this. Uh, we're going more into the sort of relationships between these economic vulnerabilities and health vulnerabilities, so ability to social distance and access healthcare. And like I said before, uh, I think we're really looking forward to this next round of data to start being able to look at, at who's resilient and who bounces back and who doesn't. So thank you all very much. And I look forward to the next presentation. All right, thanks very much, Elizabeth. Um, so next we have uh, Jethro Banda. We'll be talking about behavior change in response to the COVID-19 pandemic in Malawi, evidence from panel data. Over to you, Jethro. Thank you, Phil. I hope you can all see my slides. Okay, great. Um, yeah, uh, I will be presenting from uh, on behalf of all my um, um, uh, my uh, partners, uh, the whole team, um, basing on our results from um, a behavior change. I mean, a COVID study that we conducted in Malawi. But for this presentation, we'll be focusing mainly on changes in behaviors that um, we have seen across the three rounds of data collection. But before I go into details about um, uh, this study itself, I have to talk about COVID-19 in Malawi. Um, Malawi happens to be at least one of the last countries to register a COVID-19 confirmed case. But even before we registered uh, the first case, uh, the government had declared COVID-19 as a national disaster. And as a follow-up on that one, they had set um, uh, strategies that were meant to at least slow or uh, slow the transmission or delay the onset of the COVID-19 in Malawi, which included restricting public gatherings, closure of schools and borders, um, even uh, working from home and uh, promoting strategies that would uh, protect one from um, infection. But apart from after we had started um, a, a, a getting cases, they had uh, places where people would, uh, they would quarantine people and they also encouraged other, for those that were um, short symptoms or had been in contact with uh, a suspected case to at least uh, self-isolate. But the planned lockdown, which was supposed to start uh, mid-April, was stopped by the High Court when uh, uh, people petitioned them to. Uh, so that didn't happen, and it hasn't happened up to date. Um, when it comes to testing itself, we were a bit slow at the beginning, uh, but over time, uh, almost all districts um, in Malawi have at least one uh, testing center. So the first um, COVID case came on the 2nd of April, but uh, just after that, then we uh, started importing cases from uh, South Africa and uh, other uh, Malawians that were returning home. Um, then this was followed by local transmission, which um, in a way increased incidence. Uh, from the graph, you'd see that we, um, this cases started picking up somewhere around uh, June um, through July up to um, early August. But since mid-August, there's been quite a decrease, a decline in um, reported cases so far. Uh, as of yesterday, Malawi had uh, 5,829 confirmed cases. Um, of these, uh, sadly, 181 have resulted into deaths, but over 80% of these have uh, since recovered. Um, the cases are uh, spread across Malawi, but uh, the majority of the cases are within uh, the three large cities with uh, Blanta having the most, then followed by Lilongwe. And Mzuzu. Now, uh, about the study itself, we are conducting a four round mobile panel study, which uh, through which we want to measure uh, knowledge, attitudes, practices that uh, relate to COVID 19. We had a sampling frame uh, which contained a list of phone numbers that were collected from pre COVID 19 surveys that were read by uh, Stefan. Um, uh, in those lists, we had three types of respondents, three types of people. 
uh, current residents in Karonga continuous registra registration systems, they are siblings who may or may not have moved outside the um, a CRS and uh, former residents of the CRS who are spread throughout uh, Malawi. Now, as of today, we have managed to complete three rounds. We started um, uh, on 22nd of April. Uh, uh, through September, three rounds have been, com have been completed. All the respondents are 18 and above. Uh, we are using five interviewers who have sufficient survey experience, um, but they are working from their homes. Each um, interview session lasts up to uh, 30 minutes or so. We have questions on sources of information, uh, if they have been able to access health care, the activities that they are doing, and how they are, in a way, protecting themselves from contacting uh, COVID-19 and self-reported symptoms. Um, the initial study sought to collect numbers from uh, just above 1,000 individuals, but uh, only 779 of these uh, uh, had either had phones or we managed to find someone who would give us a phone number for us to use uh, in this study. But 567 of these have managed to complete uh, all three rounds of uh, data collection. Um, but looking at um, ages and maybe education, we are more like we have been more likely to at least uh, talk to uh, less likely to talk to younger, uh, those that are lower than less than 25 years old, and those are that have primary or no education whatsoever, uh, mainly because um, we, didn't, we didn't find um, a phone for them um, or, or uh, because their phones were unreachable. Now, uh, through this study, um, through this, present this presentation, we are trying to answer uh, possibly how uh, committed transmission of COVID-19 has somehow been uh, uh, interrupted in Malawi. We are looking at two options, uh, two reasons why this might be the case. Either that um, there is uh, a reduction in contact between people or that um, uh, transmission uh, contacts are there, but people are somehow protected uh, wearing masks or whatsoever. And as, as a result, they are unable to um, get the um, uh, virus. So um, to the results then. But before we start answering those questions a little bit about self-reported symptoms, um, with the first, uh, we, we, we experienced a peak in reports of coughs in on two in urban areas mostly, uh, but for most of the other uh, symptoms, they haven't changed as much as the coughs did. Uh, but when we talk to uh, these people, only a fraction of them uh, reported that they had been tested for COVID-19, which in a way suggests that uh, possibly the COVID-19 outbreak might have been um, considerably larger than uh, the figures that we currently have. The largest increase um, in reports for coughs was recorded in, in Blanta uh, compared to all other regions that uh, we have. Now, trying to answer uh, those questions, we explore what they told us um, uh, about places that they had visited seven days before each round of data collection. Um, as you can see from the graphs that we have, uh, nothing much has changed across uh, both rural and urban areas with market, neighbors' houses or church, uh, relatives' place, uh, being um, commonly reported for both rural and urban participants as places they have visited. Maybe a slight change that might have happened is uh, football games for rural participants, which had a, 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 a huge increase in round two, but it is now also falling back to uh, towards what the figure that we had in round one. There is an emerging trend um, that we we'll discuss later for urban participants uh, attendance of, of weddings. One other thing that we looked at is um, their involvement in economic activities outside their homes, outside their household activities, but we don't see um, there is no consistent change in, in this, except maybe for that upward trend that we see 
in rural areas. So having talked about these, um, this, uh, this going through these two slides, we see that maybe contact uh, reduction in contact might not be um, the reason why we might uh, see a decline in COVID cases in Malawi. Probably it is the transmission, I mean, uh, strategies that they have used to uh, control transmission. So uh, we had questions that looked at preventative strategies that had employed uh, uh, 30 days uh, before um, the day of the survey. Now for the whole th the three rounds of data collection, um, participants have consistently reported that they are washing their hands more, uh, more frequently. Um, and, but in round two, we saw uh, the increase in those that reported at least observing some sort of distance between them and the person that they're next to. In round three, we have seen a huge increase for both urban and rural uh, participants in reports of mask usage. I will talk about mask usage in the next few slides, but I need to highlight that um, for both round one and round two, uh, avoidance, avoiding crowded areas was the second reported strategy that was being used by both urban and rural participants. But um, this started declining in round two, and it has since been overtaken by at least those, those two um, uh, face mask use and uh, uh, physical distancing. Um, there is that clear trend in increase in uh, reports of mask usage in the past month for both urban and rural participants. Um, but one thing that I should mention here is that um, before we started round three, uh, the government had set in new rules uh, on COVID-19 uh, prevention, which uh, also made wearing of mask masks in public uh, compulsory, but also introduced a fine uh, for those that were found in public without masks. Much as implementation on this one has not been strict, uh, I would think that this might have in a way contributed towards increase in reports of mask usage across both rural and uh, urban participants. Still on the use of face masks, uh, participants report that not all of them uh, consistently use masks when they leave their homes. For urban participants, about 35% of them um, reported to us that uh, sometimes they go outside their homes without masks uh, compared to, I mean, with uh, about 44% of rural participants reporting the same. But when it comes to ownership of masks, 92% of urban participants versus 85% of rural participants reported that they owned a mask on the day that we uh, had an interview with them in the third round, which was between August and September. Now, having come this far, it would suggest in a way that maybe um, uh, the, 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 the reduction in the cases might be uh, due to the strategies that they have employed, not necessarily the, uh, their pre preventive strategies that, that they have employed, not necessarily the uh, reduction in contact. So in summary, um, we see that the COVID-19 cases in Malawi peaked between June and July. Um, the same uh, period where we had our round two, which saw, also saw a peak in uh, reported coughs in urban participants, which might uh, suggest that there was a widespread out, uh, outbreak in cities, which um, presents something that is similar to Cero survey um, studies that have been done in Blantyre, which confirmed that maybe COVID-19 might be widely spread than, than it is. Uh, but um, the, the data that we have also suggests that um, the, the decline in transmission might not be due to changes in social activities or contact patterns, uh, but we note that participants are moving towards uh, strategies that would um, enable contacting other people while at the same time reducing the transmission. I talked about something that I would return to. Um, so fourth round, I think will be important for us in that to uh, show the trends, if at all people have started relaxing uh, measures that they put in place. We see one um, uh, emerging trend, which is the increase in urban participants reporting attendance of weddings, which has increased from, um, has more than uh, almost tripled 
participants. Finally, I should thank uh, the work that the interviewers have done. Uh, it wasn't easy uh, talking to uh, those 567 participants three times uh, over a period of five months. Sometimes they had to make a lot of calls uh, in order for them to at least uh, successfully talk to them. And the entire Meru team that have in one way or another supported this week, this week. Thanks a lot. Okay, great, thank you very much, Jethro. Um, so next we're switching uh, context again, going back to Kenya. So we have Beth Kangwana who's gonna talk about the short-term social health and economic effects of COVID-19 mitigation measures on adolescents and their health households in four counties in Kenya. Hello, um, everyone. Um, Philip, can you please confirm that you can see my screen? We can see your screen and hear you clearly. Thank you. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'll be presenting on, um, as Philip said, social on the social health, education and economic effects of COVID-19 on adolescents in Kenya. Um, and I'll be presenting on behalf of the team from Population Council's Poverty, Gender and Youth Program. Um, and this was a, a study which was in collaboration with the Executive Office of the President in Kenya and also Population Council. Sorry. Um, so the, uh, there were two main uh, objectives for this study. The first was to understand the social, economic and education and health effects of COVID-19 on Kenyan adolescents. And we included both boys and girls to allow for an understanding of the different effects of COVID-19 on gender. We also uh, wanted to generate data uh, which would be able to guide post-COVID-19 adolescent programming and policy in Kenya. We collected data from several different cohorts that we uh, had already established from previous studies. Uh, so overall, we collected data from around 4,000 different adolescents across four different counties. So that's Nairobi, Wajir, Kilifi, and Kisumu. Um, our adolescents aged between 10 to 19 years old. And uh, in addition to interviewing the adolescents, we also interviewed the household head for each of the households and all the interviews were carried out um, over the phone. So just in a bit more detail regarding the sampling, um, in Nairobi, we used cohorts that were, um, that were generated from the Adolescent Girls Initiative Kenya study and also from uh, the Nisitu study. Um, the, the co um, these cohorts were established via, via household listing. Um, we had originally sampled around 3,400 households and were able to interview uh, two, 2009 adolescents in March. And uh, the interviews, um, we were able to interview the original adolescents from these, uh, from both Ajik and Nisitu for the Nairobi site. In Wajir, uh, we also used the Adolescent Girls Initiative Kenya endline sample. Uh, we have or we have we did collect the contact details for the um, adolescents from the previous um, rounds of data collection prior to COVID. So we used those phone contacts, and uh, we were able to reach around 1,800 adolescents in Wajir. Uh, two thirds were adolescent girls, and a third were boy uh, were boys from the same household. Again, in Kilifi, which is at the coast of Kenya, uh, we had another study called the NIA study. Um, and the last data collection period pre-COVID was in 2019. So again, we were able to reach the phone con um, through phone, um, the respondents from the 2019 round. And uh, we were able to, uh, the total overall, we had around two thirds um, of NIA girls. And uh, we were able to also reach around a third, um, sorry, the, a third of the cohort that we reached were boys from the same households. And finally, in Kisumu, we, um, we used the cohort from the DREAM study. We had to resample the, um, the households and uh, find girls and, um, 
and and boys that were that we could reach on the phone um, just because the dreams cohort had it's been it had been a while since the last data collection round so after resampling in the um in the final round of phone calls uh, for this COVID study, we were able to, uh, to get around two third girls and a third boys. So just um, a word of caution is that uh, because of, we are reaching respondents by phone, there is a bias in the data that we're collecting. Uh, the bias is that we, we were, you know, not everyone has a phone and it's likely that the, the poorer, um, uh, those in the poorer quintiles are less likely to have phones, so there might be bias in, in um, the data we're presenting. Um, and also, um, we carried out the surveys across the different study sites in different at different times. So in Nairobi, we uh, completed the data collection in June, in Wajir in July, and then lastly, both in Kilifi and Kisumu in August. So I'll go through our preliminary results. And these are just basic descriptive results where we compare sites and age groups. And we are, um, after this, we, well, in the background, we are continuing to work on a few papers, trying to um, carry out a, a few hypothesis testing to see, um, to test some hypotheses. So um, first we looked at education. Um, we found that 10% of adolescents who were in school um, pre-COVID uh, reported that they were worried that they would not enroll back into school um, when schools open. And so schools closed around March of 2020 and they're opening in October, well, this month. And um, a lack of money uh, to be able to pay, uh, pay for school fees was the main barrier um, that adolescents reported to school re-enrollment. Again, over 90% of adolescents um, have been doing some form of learning from home during the COVID period, and we didn't really see much difference in, in gender. Um, one exception in Wajir is that um, less than 50% reported that they were learning any or carrying out any class activities at home. In terms of digital learning, we saw that there was almost no use of tablets or computers. Um, there was some use of mobile phones, um, but uh, there was higher use of phones in urban areas compared to rurals, uh, the rural areas, and girls also had less access to digital learning compared to boys. Now, again, in Wajir, um, the digital divide was more um, um, less to do with mobile phones and more related to having access to either radio or TV since almost um, none of the adolescents had access to phones. And then uh, the most common sources of educational materials that were used for learning across these sites were either reading books, um, uh, which they sourced themselves or their parents had sourced, or um, give materials that were given uh, from their schools. So we looked at the economic effects of COVID-19 across the different sites. Um, and this was at the household level. So we had interviewed the household head for each of the households. Now the figure on your left, um, here we asked us the household heads if their um, amount of, the amount of income that they had, that they were earning had changed since the start of the pandemic. Um, so around uh, March time and around 80% uh, on average of household heads reported that they had um, either complete or partial loss of income, again, with the exception of Wajir. Uh, the figure on the right is uh, showing uh, the number of household heads who experienced increased food costs since the start of COVID-19. And uh, around three quarters had um, on average across the sites had reported experiencing increased costs of food. Um, we also saw the data uh, through the data that there were food uh, security issues that were arising. Um, again, with the exception of Wajir, we saw that around 70% of household heads and uh, on average um, around or just under 80% of adolescents uh, reported either skipping a meal or eating less um, in the past two weeks due to COVID. And this was uh, higher, this observation was higher in the urban areas compared to the rural areas. Now in Nairobi, Wajir and Khalifi, the biggest um, need that was reported currently was not being able to, um, to have or 
to have access to food, while in Kisumu it was cash followed by food. Um, we looked at, uh, we evaluated adolescents' mental health. Um, and what we saw is that on average, around 80% uh, of adolescents uh, reported feeling anxious, threatened, concerned when they uh, thought about COVID-19. Again, on average, around 50% reported having little interest or pleasure in the, the, the things that they usually enjoy. And we saw again across the sites, uh, at least three of, of the four sites that around 50% reported feeling either down, depressed or hopeless in the past two weeks. Um, again, uh, Wajir uh, was an exception where um, across the, um, generally there was very little reporting in levels, uh, high, high levels of mental health stress. Um, and then what we also saw that came uh, through in the data was that um, around 10% of adolescents reported uh, not having access to healthcare services that they would have otherwise needed during the pandemic. Uh, girls were more likely to skip healthcare um, across all the sites, apart from Wujia. And the main reasons for skipping healthcare or you know, accessing healthcare was cost. And this was followed by either a lack of services, medicines, or fear of being um, infected by COVID. Uh, moving on to men's, uh, menstrual hygiene and menstrual health. Um, so among um, menstruating girls, over half uh, um, of them had trouble or reported having trouble accessing menstrual hygiene management products since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic started. Um, and in Wajir, this was uh, around one third. Um, most girls were not getting their pads at school. So in Kenya, or reported not getting their pads at school. So just to explain that uh, in Kenya, we have um, uh, a government initiative of supplying sanitary pads through um, schools. And uh, what we had expected was that um, a large number of girls would now not have uh, have access to sanitary pads because the schools are closed. But uh, the data showed that only around 20% of girls reported that they, that uh, pre-COVID, that they were receiving pads in, in school in Nairobi. This was slightly higher in Wajir, around 50%. Um, and 14% in Kilifi and Kisumu, only 28% of girls reported ever having access to pads through the school system. Um, we then asked adolescents how much time they spent on household chores and now compared to pre-COVID. And adolescents reported spending more time doing household chores. Um, there was a clear gender gap with more girls reporting uh, more time spent on household chores compared to boys, especially in uh, Nairobi, where we saw around 51% uh, girl, of girls compared to 36% of boys reporting increased ho uh, household chores or spending time on household chores. And in Wajir, this was 63% um, for the girls compared to 41% um, of boys. Um, adolescents also um, reported experiencing increased tension of violence. Um, so in violence, we looked at emotional, physical, sexual violence at home. And this was especially, well, was, um, mostly reported in Nairobi, um, where we saw around 24% of adolescents reporting this and uh, slightly lower in Kisumu. Finally, we looked at uh, sexual and reproductive health. Um, what we saw was there was very low rates of pregnancy or child marriage um, so far. So very negligible, ne negligible amount of girls, so 1% and less in the sample reported either being pregnant or married since COVID-19 had started. However, what we did see was increased uh, levels of risk factors uh, for early pregnancy um, or marriage. So we saw increased school closures, um, obviously because the schools were closed, um, economic stress, which I've already presented, um, slightly increased levels of transactional sex and no use of contraceptives. And um, a bit more about the contraceptives. So across the sites, 
uh, 90% and above of girls reported that they did not want to get pregnant, uh, but only 20% or less were reporting using any form of family planning. Uh, the rest of the girls reported that they were not um, being sexually active. And uh, we were able to collect uh, use of contraceptives in Nairobi, Kilifi, and Kisumu. We were unable to ask uh, family planning questions um, of unmarried girls in Wajir, um, as this is seen as a cultural taboo. So next steps, we're hoping that, um, well, we're planning to collect qualitative data to verify the findings that we have so far. Um, we'll be interviewing girls, boys, parents, and community leaders um, across the different sites. And um, we'll be adding a few more additional counties. And then we'll also be carrying out a second round of quantitative data collection um, early next year. We'll be looking at uh, the longer term effects of school dropout, teenage pregnancy and child marriage. So by the end, we're hoping that we'd have um, around 3000 adolescent girls and um, just over a thousand boys in the study. And we're hoping to also continue including in interviewing the adults um, of the household, just to understand how the, um, the impacts of COVID on the parents are affecting the, uh, the adolescents. So, and the other thing I mentioned is we are hoping now to carry out some further analyses on the data we have. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Beth. So next up, we have Ileana Kohler, who will be presenting uh, It Takes a Village, Response to COVID-19 in Malawi and its Implications for Public Health and Social Policies. Thank you very much, Phil. So I'm delighted to have this chance to present our COVID-19 research in Malawi. I would like first to acknowledge my collaborators on this project, Fabrice Kempton and Hans-Peter Kohler from the University of Pennsylvania. Alberto Ciancio, who was at Penn and recently moved to the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, Victor Mopazo from the College of Medicine in Blantyre, Malawi, and James Muera from the Invest in Knowledge Initiative in Zamba, uh, Malawi. Uh, the implementation of the COVID-19 survey as part of the Malawi Longitudinal Study of Families and Health has been a truly team effort. And I would like also to acknowledge our incredible team of supervisors and senior interviewers who implemented the data collection between June and mid-August and who made over, than, over 12,000 phone calls to collect this uh, data. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, apologies for this, okay. So when we look at how the COVID-19 pandemic is unfolding around the world, we face an African puzzle. Africa countries report about 3% of all global COVID-19 cases and about 2.5% of all global deaths with cases and deaths declining most recently. Uh, the current course of the COVID-19 pandemic in Africa is in very sharp contrast to the availability of resources and to the infrastructural constraints that most of the sub-Saharan African low-income countries face. And Malawi is a very good example of this situation. In March, the government of Malawi estimated that they need about $213 million to be able to adequately address the COVID-19 pandemic in the country. And at the same time, they had only $19 million available to do so. And yet, as of September 24th this year, Malawi ranks 173rd in terms of reported COVID-19 cases per capita. So besides this seemingly very low prevalence of COVID-19 infection and deaths uh, and death cases, the pandemic has wide ranging implications uh, in, in sub-Saharan African low income countries, ranging from increasing food insecurity, malnutrition, or decreasing children's immun immunizations to levels that we have last observed in the 1990s. And in fact, our team has already documented some of these implications. For instance, the healthcare providers whom we interviewed as part of the COVID-19 survey reported already that they observed decline in patients who seek healthcare for the treatment of non-communicable diseases or other infectious 
uh, diseases. So what distinguishes the populations in sub-Saharan African low-income countries from many other parts of the world is actually their very distinguished pandemic experience. Many of these countries have faced the, and are facing the HIV AIDS pandemic for several decades, and the Western African countries have several Ebola outbreaks. So the past lessons from dealing with epidemic, with pandemics of similar proportions, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, suggests that while on one side, it's actually very useful to have swift measure, measurement measures, such as the distribution of soap or washing stations and et cetera, this is, is very useful. Actually, the past lessons illustrate that this meaningful involvement in the, of the local communities and of the local leadership is particularly important for fighting pandemics since these local communities and local leadership can shape the population-wide response to COVID-19 and to pandemics, and they can also amplify related public health messages related to measures addressing the, uh, the pandemics and the, the consequences. Our research focus today is on the factors that determine behavioral, economic, and social responses to COVID-19 in Malawi. And particularly, we focus on the role of the local leadership to mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 in these poor rural uh, Malawian communities. So for our study, we used the COVID data from the COVID-19 phone survey, which was conducted as part of the Malawi Longitudinal Study of Families and Health. The survey was conducted during the period June 2nd to August 17, 2020. We had a total target sample of roughly 3,000 individuals and the eligible respondents were MLSFH respondents who were last surveyed in 2017, 18 and 19 and for whom we, have, we had recorded phone numbers. We also included interviews with village heads and healthcare providers who were last surveyed in 2019. We completed successfully 2,262 uh, surveys with a couple of proxy um, interviews. Uh, the survey was conducted in three areas in Malawi, in the district of Rumpi in the north, in the district of Michinji in the central part of the country, and in Balaka, which is in the southern part of the country. So working in Malawi for more than 20 years and having data for more 20 years, allows, actual, allows us actually to compare the perceptions and how people view, view the implications of two pandemics, the HIV AIDS pandemic and the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is depicted here in this figure that shows the subjective perceptions of the study participants about the current prevalence of HIV infections and COVID-19 infections in the community, where the prevalence is measured as the number of individuals out of 10 being infected with HIV or the SARS-CoV-2. And the, the figure clearly illustrates that the Malawians see the prevalence, have a correct knowledge or correct perceptions of the current uh, prevalence of COVID and, uh, and HIV with estimating the prevalence of HIV much higher as compared to the prevalence of COVID-19. If we look at their subjective perception of the likelihood of being currently infected with HIV and COVID, the picture is different. So they see much higher likelihood to be currently infected with COVID-19 than with HIV. And lastly, as I said, we have longitudinal data for that allow us actually to compare the perceived extra mortality if somebody is infected with HIV, AIDS and with COVID. This is shown in this figure. And I wanna emphasize that what I'm showing on the left side of the figure, which is the perceived extra mortality for HIV and AIDS, refers to the year 2006 before ART was implemented in Malawi. So when the Malawians or our study population experienced a very similar situa situation as our days, widely ranging pandemic without, without availability of treatment or um, vaccine. So uh, the figure shows that this perceived extra mortality 
effects of, of HIV and COVID is very similar. So to sum it up, our data suggests that people in rural Malawi have indeed very, very good understanding of the pandemic dynamics, of the COVID-19 pandemic dynamics in terms of infection risks and in terms of also of the implications, what it means to be infected by COVID-19. So these correct perceptions um, also result in the respective responses, responses in terms of behavioral changes as well as economic uh, behavior. So in um, this figure actually summarizes, uh, looks at the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic in these rural communities in which we work. And um, we see that um, the majority of our population actually reports that they have already reduced non-food consumption as a response to the pandemic. Over 50% of the respondents say that their economic situation deteriorated compared to the year before. And substantial fractions of the sample re report that they have reduced food consumptions, they have reduced health expenditures, or they had to borrow money as a, re as to, as a result of the uh, COVID-19 uh, economic consequences. The implications of the, um, of the pandemic go beyond economic consequences and they affect also uh, the, the access to healthcare or the worries of our respondents in terms of access to healthcare. So this figure shows that a more than 50% of our respondents are actually worried to getting access to, to malaria treatment as a result of the pandemic. Substantial fractions of our sample are worried to get access to HIV testing, to ART, to pre and postnatal care, to for treatment for NCDs, or vaccination for um, children. So the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the life of this rural community is noticeable. And our focus is actually to investigate which factors determine how people respond to the impact of this COVID, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And specifically, we look at the role of the local leadership and specifically the role of the village heads. So in this figure, we show the association between living in a community with a village head who is socially active and various behavioral responses to COVID-19. So we define village head as socially active if he or she has instructed respondents to cancel village meetings, have to uh, keep distance from other people while fetching water, stop public works or stopping recreational activities, such as, for instance, play, playing soccer on the common village uh, playground. So our results from, from our regression model shows that uh, living in a village with a socially active um, or having socially active village health results in a higher number of known COVID-19 related symptoms. With these respondents are also more likely to wear face masks. They are more likely also to report decreased time spent outside of the household and they are more likely to have avoided contacts with other people out of the household. We define an economically active village head if he or she has instructed respondents to create a village fund for emergency purposes to distribute resources such as food, money, medical supplies to the most vulnerable members of the village community. And this table so shows the association of having economically active village heads and variety of economic responses. Um, the, our results show that there is a positive association that respondents living in a village with economically active village, head, village heads are more likely to have reduced uh, their non-food um, expenditures. They are less likely to report increased worries about food and um, they're also less likely to report increase in eating class as compared to last years. 
We also look at the relationship between uh, having socially and economically active village head and uh, different outcomes such as life satisfaction and subjective well-being. And we have found a strong relationship suggesting that having a socially and or economically active village has is associated with higher life satisfactions. Uh, we also look at um, the role of institutions such as uh, healthcare workers and spe specifically the role of the government and trust in these institutions and how this relates to outcomes among our respondents and our results suggested that trust in healthcare workers and government to respond to COVID-19 are in fact positively associated with both the levels and changes in subjective well-being and self-reported health among these respondents, specifically individuals who trust institutions, these institutions, the healthcare workers and the government that they can deal better or they can deal with COVID-19 and the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic have better self-reported well-being and self-reported health, which also suggests or indicates that they're possibly also less impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, based on our results, we actually, our results suggest that trust in institutions during this pandemic time is very important for the well-being of our, of our respondents. And we also find this very strong association between the role of the village has and outcomes, behavioral and economic outcomes we observe among the study participants. So, we wanted to explore this relationship a little bit further, and we wanted actually to look at uh, how is in fact uh, trust in this institution mediated, and do uh, local does the local leadership play a particular role to um, to bolster trust in institutions and in important institutions during the pandemic, the healthcare workers and the government, and these results are uh, summarized in this table that. Um, show that um, respondents who live in, the, in communities where the village heads are socially, socially active are, uh, have uh, report higher trust in the, health, health, in the health workers to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic and to address the COVID-19 pandemic. And they also report or they think that the government is more truthful about messages related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So to sum it up, our results suggest that uh, local leadership, specifically the village has, are highly important to shape behavioral, social, and economic responses to the COVID-19 pandemic in Malawi, and that they may play a very important role to potentially mitigate the impact of the pandemic in these rural communities. Uh, we find also a very important role uh, of the village heads uh, in this relationship uh, between with the with institutions such as the healthcare system and the government, and they and they play important role to, role to build the trust in these institutions during the pandemic. Uh, this result is particularly important because it actually suggests that the local leadership and the involvement in the local leadership in Managing the implications of the of, of the pandemic actually represents a very important channel uh, for the dissemination of public health policy uh, that come from either from the healthcare system or from the government. Um, I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any suggestions, questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you very much, Ileana. So finally, um, I'll turn it to Linnea Zimmerman, who will present on the impact of COVID-19 on maternal health service utilization in Ethiopia. Thanks, Bill. Okay. All right, can everyone see my screen okay? Phil, I'm just looking at you. Okay. Seems Seems like yes. Uh, I think it's in presentation mode. You might want to put it on full screen okay. mode if possible. Slideshow. Was that better? There we go. Perfect. Okay, great. And now you probably also see all the Q and A questions as well. Okay. 
All right, um, I'm going to go pretty quickly just because we are running out of time. So I will be talking about maternal health service utilization in Ethiopia. Um, we work closely with Addis Ababa University. Um, and so uh, acknowledging my uh, co-authors there. So um, as, as we all know, uh, one of the large concerns about the COVID-19 pandemic um, beyond the immediate effects of infection from SARS-CoV-2 and development of COVID-19 um, is that there are anticipated changes to service coverage um, of many different um, health, uh, health issues as the previous presenter very nicely explained. Um, but there are some modeled estimates that um, find that a, an even small reduction in service coverage of key reproductive maternal newborn and child health interventions of about 10% for about six months could result in uh, an increase in child deaths of almost 250,000 and maternal deaths of 12,200 um, globally. So what we wanted to assess with our data is what was the immediate impact of COVID-19 on health facility delivery patterns in Ethiopia. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the survey design because it, it's a little bit confusing. Um, so this project is part of Performance Monitoring for Action Ethiopia. It is the sister project uh, from the first presentation. And this project is a little bit different in that uh, we, one, the, the content of the survey is much, much larger. Um, it doesn't focus only on family planning, but includes um, primarily a focus on maternal and newborn care. And it has actually three components to it. So there's a cross-sectional survey that's implemented annually, and that really focuses on reproductive and family planning, reproductive health and family planning. And then there is a panel survey that is implemented in six regions in Ethiopia, and those six regions account for about 90% of the total population. Uh, and within those regions, in October, November, December of 2019, we enrolled women who at that stage were either currently pregnant or who had given birth in the past six months. And then we follow all of those women. Uh, we, follow, we had the baseline interview at that stage and we follow all of those women at six weeks postpartum, six months postpartum and one year postpartum. So it's ongoing data collection and it has been ongoing uh, through the six week period from October until June. We also have an SDP survey that is also conducted annually from 2019 to 2022, and that's in all regions of the country. And so the, the panel is included in 217 enumeration areas across, across these six regions. I just wanna highlight a little bit um, how this issue of continuous data collection comes into play. So in April, the Federal Ministry of Health instituted a, a state of emergency in response to COVID-19. And we halted data collection. And then we restarted data collection in June. Um, and that was done after consultation with the Federal Ministry of Health and, and IRBs. So we had uh, from about April to June, a time period where we were not collecting data. And so we, we used that opportunity to modify the questionnaires for our six week, six months and one year survey to include some additional questions about COVID-19. And I just wanna walk through a little bit um, the data collection patterns. So if you look at the top, those these first two rows are women who either had delivered already when we first interviewed them, so they were already postpartum at enrollment, or it was a woman who delivered shortly thereafter. And so both her six week and her six month interviews were collected before the COVID-19 pandemic. The, the questionnaires that they completed obviously had no information about COVID because it it didn't exist at that time, um, but we have included questions at the one year follow-up that would ask some information. And then if we go down a couple of rows, these are women who delivered um, prior to COVID, they completed the six week questionnaire approximately six weeks later, but because of our, our stop in data collection, uh, their timing to the six month questionnaire is actually extended. So it may have been six months and a couple of weeks before we were able to recontact them. And then finally down at the bottom, um, and this is these are the births that are of particular interest. These are women who gave birth um, either immediately before COVID-19, uh, the, the state of emergency was put into effect. Uh, and so their, um, 
interview was conducted more than six weeks later, but we did have an opportunity to adjust the questionnaire or the women who gave birth between uh, the, or essentially the women who gave birth after the state of emergency was put into effect um, on April 8th. And those are women who we were able to actually assess whether or not COVID-19 affected their delivery patterns. So we compared health facility delivery location for women who delivered pre-COVID and then those, um, to those who delivered during COVID. And we stratified the analysis between urban and rural women. And that is a function both of the extremely different patterns in health facility utilization that already existed between urban and rural women, where the vast majority of urban women deliver in hospitals and health centers relative to rural areas where over half of women deliver at home. But also because, and, and we'll we will see this later, the impact of COVID-19 has been felt much more acutely in urban centers. So our primary variable of interest is whether the woman gave birth either pre or post COVID. And we define that actually as April 15th, um, just to give, although the state of emergency was put into place on the 8th, we assume that there's going to be some lag in getting that information out uh, to all women. Um, and actually, if we repeat this um, interview, using post or during COVID being May 1st, we will actually see that the results are even stronger. So there does appear to be some kind of lag period. And then we also accounted for age parity, wealth and education. And we don't actually expect that these are confounders in the sense that they're related to whether or not a woman gave birth pre and post COVID. Um, but because delivery uh, utilization is so different across Ethiopia and across these socio-demographic characteristics, we just wanted to include them. To, to sort of demonstrate this. For urban, um, for the urban sample, we did a logistic regression where we were only comparing women who delivered either in a health post or a health center to women who delivered in a hospital. And the reason, as I said, is that there are very few women who delivered at home. But in the rural areas, we did a multinomial logistic regression where we used home delivery as the base outcome. And then we compared whether women delivered in a health post or a health center or whether they delivered in a hospital. And finally, we end with some descriptive statistics of, of women who said that COVID-19 did affect where they delivered. And we um, used design-based F statistics to see whether these differed by any uh, of these background characteristics. So in total, there were 2,574 women who are uh, included in this sample and 371 of them delivered during the COVID period, so uh, after April 15th. So certainly 85% of women were, 84% of deliveries were in the pre-COVID period, but there's still a reasonable sample size to compare. And just to note, um, the rest of these statistics are from the pooled sample. We didn't um, compare pre and post COVID. So 45% of all births to women uh, in the cohort occurred at home. 10% of births were to women age 15 to 19, and 78% of women in our sample live in, in rural areas. And so Ethiopia is definitely a predominantly rural area and that will influence, uh, sorry, a rural country and that will influence some of our findings. So this is on the national scale and this is by month. So there's fairly large confidence intervals because over each month we have about 300 to 350 births depending on the month. Um, and so you can see in blue that these are women who delivered in a health center or a health post, so a lower level health facility, generally only equipped to give uh, basic emergency obstetric care. And over time, that rate seemed to be going down until there's a sharp increase in April and May, well, between April and May. And just to note, we do have deliveries in June, but we collapsed the May and June deliveries into May just because there were relatively few in June relative to the other months. Um, home deliveries actually stay fairly stable. So we don't see, luckily, we don't see a very high increase in home delivery rates in the national sample. But we do see, again, between April and May, a sharp drop in the hospital delivery rates. So when we stratify this by urban and rural to see um, whether or not this is statistically significant and what might be related to this, um, urban women who gave birth during COVID-19 were significantly less likely to deliver in a hospital relative to women who delivered prior to COVID-19. So the adjusted odds ratio here is 0.59, so almost half 
as likely to deliver in a hospital relative to a health center. Um, and then you can also see that wealthy women, educated women and women who are over age 30 are also much more likely to deliver in a hospital. So this is not surprising, but it does show that there are very important um, gaps in, in health or hospital versus health center delivery rates. Um, and that most privileged women are still delivering in hospitals um, while less privileged women are much more likely to deliver in a health center. When we look at the rural relationships, we actually don't see any change pre and post COVID. And this is not terribly surprising. As I said, the majority of restrictions and the majority of the impact of COVID-19 has been felt in urban areas um, and predominantly in Addis Ababa. So what we see here is that at least by June, there were not major changes in the percentages or of women who are delivering um, in home versus health center versus hospital. So rural women who gave birth during COVID-19 were no less likely to deliver in a health center or a hospital than women who gave birth prior to COVID-19. And that on the whole is good. Um, it means that we're not seeing, at least early in the pandemic, large shifts towards avoiding um, health centers and hospitals when delivering. It also means that there's still a large percentage of women who are delivering at home. Um, in rural areas, nulliparous women are more likely to deliver in a health facility. So here we can see that um, parity. So if a woman had had one to two children prior to this pregnancy or three or more, that they were significantly less likely to deliver in a health center or a hospital. And wealthy and educated women are more likely to deliver in a health facility, um, either a uh, health center or a hospital than poor and less educated women. So there is still definitely social inequities that are at play in where women are delivering. So finally, we wanted to look at uh, whether or not women reported that COVID-19 had influenced where they gave birth. So among women who gave birth during the COVID-19 period, so the N is at 371 women, significantly higher percentages of urban women said that COVID-19 affected where they delivered. And that's 21% here versus uh, in urban areas versus 8% in rural areas. Uh, among all women who said that COVID-19 affected where they delivered, and this is again, only 50 women, so it has to be um, you know, regarded with some skepticism with the sample size, but 72% that said they were afraid of getting or spreading COVID-19. So it was definitely driven by fears of transmission um, or infection. 42% were afraid that uh, they would be alone during the delivery so that they would not be able to have uh, their partner or their mother or uh, another caregiver with them. And 36% 36% said that they had no transportation available. Um, during the state of emergency, public transportation was shut down um, as were the majority of taxis. And so if people did not have their own private transportation, then they were very limited in how they could access services. So overall, in discussion and conclusion, urban women who delivered during COVID-19 period were significantly less likely to deliver in hospitals, although there was no significant shift in rural areas. And while it is reassuring that home delivery rates are not increasing, or at least not by this time, shifts to lower level facilities are potentially problematic. I mentioned before that we uh, also do service delivery point surveys and we do show um, that the health centers are significantly less likely to have access to all essential medicines, um, as well as other quality indicators. So the shift to lower level facilities is potentially problematic, particularly for women who may experience a complex uh, obstetric emergency. Of women who delivered during COVID-19, only 10% said COVID-19 influenced where they delivered, but this was much higher amongst urban, wealthy, and educated women. So these are not generally the women that we are the most concerned about in terms of delivering health services, but it does indicate that there are impacts that are being felt in it, but it does seem like that those impacts are being primarily targeted or primarily felt within um, Addis Ababa particularly, but also um, amongst the urban centers. So that is it. Uh, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you very much, Linnea. And uh, that brings us to the end of our presentation. So first I wanna thank all of our panelists for the excellent presentations and really compelling research and results that you showed today. 
Now, I'd hope that we'd have a little bit of time for questions at the end, um, but uh, we're running a little bit short on time. So um, I wanted to ask all of our panelists one question that was posed by Rachel Robinson, because I think this equally applies to everyone who presented today. So the question from Rachel is, how much of uh, Sub-Saharan's uh, Africa's low COVID rates are the result of an epidemiological success story versus low levels of reporting and testing? So I think uh, Bess gave a really good response to this from the Kenya perspective, but I thought I'd ask our other panelists if they had uh, what their thoughts were on this from, uh, from the other countries that were uh, discussed uh, today. So what do people think about how much of Sub-Saharan Africa's low COVID rates are the result of epidemiological success versus low levels of reporting and testing? So um, I, I think when I mentioned that, I sorry, this is Elizabeth, I, I did sort of say with all the caveats of having imperfect information. And I think that is a really good point that we do have imperfect information. Um, and so, my answer is going to be a guess, <laughs> um, and I'll, but I'll tell you what, what the guess is based on. And, and my guess is that um, the that the rates um, that it is higher than it than is being reported. And I think you know the perfect measure of that would be vital registration systems, excess mortality. Um, but you know, vital registration systems are far from perfect everywhere, um, but particularly in the areas that we're talking about. But you know, when you look at countries like South Africa that do have vital registration systems, they are actually, you know, the better the vital registration systems, the more you are seeing excess mortality. So I do think it's higher than we're seeing by measurement. Um, but I don't, I think it, even taking that into account, I do think that COVID levels are low and um, or comparatively low. And the, the, the piece of data that makes me think that, and you can believe it or not, is that we do actually, in our survey, we actually asked people, you know, do you know anyone who has COVID or, and, and obviously this is totally imperfect, but you know, the, the numbers were like less than 1% or like one, less than 2%. They were sort of between one and 2% at the time um, who knew of anyone who had contracted COVID. Um, and, you know, that is imperfect for lots of reasons, but I'm just comparing to my own experience 20 years ago, doing this kind of research on HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we're similarly in a DSS site asking people, and at that time there was huge stigma, nobody admitted to having HIV, but absolutely everybody knew someone who had it. So I do think that if it was a, a hidden rampant epidemic that in these nationally representative surveys, when we're asking people, are you aware of any cases of COVID? What, regardless of what the government is posting officially, we would have seen more people say yes. Um, so those are my sort of two pieces of perfect, imperfect information that I am triangulating between, but I, I, I think that, yeah, that it is higher than probably we're measuring, but I still think it's relatively uh, low. So okay. that's my answer. Great, well, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, much as I'd like to continue the discussion, it looks like we're about out of time, unfortunately. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah Curran, who's gonna wrap us up with some final notes. Uh, thank you, Phil. I just wanted to um, let share my screen and let you know that we will have one more um, event on November 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you to everybody who participated and joined us in the conversation with an active Q&A and to all the participants. Um, and our next seminar will be the mortality impact of COVID-19. Um, and it will be three papers uh, around US life expectancy, uh, US mortality estimates at the county level and uh, a comparison of COVID death rates by age and sex across worlds. And, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. And just a quick, um, just a quick thank you to Phil again for organizing. Thank you to the PAA staff for hosting and making this possible. And, um, and thank you to my co-organizers, Eileen Kermans, Giovanna Merrily, Jen Dowd, and Pam Hurd. So thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. <laughs>